Um, at this time, I think we'll let the kids go. So grateful for our children's ministry, David and Shannon, and the great work they're doing. They're doing a phenomenal work. I've said this before, and I'll say this again. In fact, I'm going to say it again, that God has brought such a strong team at Spirit Walk Ministries that most of the time I feel like the weakest link. Uh, and that's no kind of false humility. We really have a tremendous team here. Our youth and children and music are phenomenal. Uh, I'm just doing my best try, just to try to keep up. So, If you have your Bibles today, so I'm going to do my best today to try to keep up. That's okay. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 3. Um, we, uh, uh, I, I preached on this same passage last year at Mother's Day, but I preached to about five people. Um, that was me and my wife, my mother-in-law, and neither one of them really cared to hear what I had to say um, at Mother's Day. And um, hard to tell my wife how to be a good mother. I've tried. She just doesn't listen. Um, but uh, that was during the uh, shutdown with the coronavirus. I want to go back and revisit this and, and look at it again. The title of my sermon today is Mothers Make the Difference. Mothers Make the Difference. Um, we had our mother-daughter tea yesterday, and, and uh, my daughter, my oldest daughter, uh, was the one that, that did the devotion um, and I've been told she did a, a fantastic job. Um, she better have. Um, that's my kid. No, I'm playing. Um, but the, the, the theme of her devotion was, he sees you. He sees you. For every mother that felt like that they were all alone and no one cared or no one noticed, he sees you. Mothers, I want to say today that you make the difference. Now, fathers, Father's Day is coming, and if you've listened to me in this service or in this church for any length of time, you know that I believe that, that fathers set the tone for the family. That is my firm belief. But it's mothers that if, if fathers set the key, like when we do music up here and we'll do a song in the key of C or the key of E flat or whatever it may be, um, Fathers set the key, but in that key, there's a melody that the song has to follow that gives that key beauty and warmth, depth, that gives it, can make it exciting, can make it somber, can make it sad, can make it thrilling. Can ma it's, the, it, it's the melody that makes the key. It gives it, uh, I, I, the only word I can think of, my dad used to say, panache. Fathers, you set the key. Mothers, you're the melody that make the song beautiful. Mothers, you make the difference. If you don't hear anything else from me today, mothers, you make the difference. Please know, in the eyes of God, You make the difference. You matter. And so I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 3. We're going to look at that for a minute. I want to read through just a few verses, starting at verse 14. You're saying, verse 14, that's the fall. What an odd place for a Mother's Day sermon. Just bear with me. Genesis chapter 3. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly thou shalt go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the, women, unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception in sorrow. Uh, thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of your life. 
thorns and also in thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shall thou eat bread till thou return into the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. I want to give you a little history about Mother's Day. Origin of Mother's Day, it dates back to the years before the Civil War. A woman by the name of Ann Reeves Jarvis stated that started a Mother's Day work clubs to teach local women how to properly care for children. See, moms, and you always thought your mother-in-law was just the first one to try to tell you how to raise your kid. It's been going around for years. You're not alone. That was supposed to be a joke, but I think for some women it hit just a little too close to home. So I'll move on. These clubs later became Mother's Friendship Day, when mothers would gather together with soldiers uh, from the Confederate and the Union in order to promote reconciliation. Uh, Julia Ward Howe uh, later picked up the mantle with Mother's Peace Day as a call to action for mothers to come together and promote world peace. And then the first official Mother's Day was organized in 1908, and Woodrow Wilson declared it a national holiday in 1914. So Mother's Day has been around for a while. Just an odd fact, just so you know, more phone calls are made on Mother's Day than any other day of the year. Mothers, you matter. You always have. I want to look at this passage of Scripture, and I want to bring out some things. I want you to look in verse 15, the, the curse. We're talking about the curse, right? In verse 15, the curse, it brings up the enmity that is between the serpent and the woman, not the man. This is why men think snakes are cool and women flip out about them, I guess. I don't know. But notice that the curse is between the serpent and the woman. Verse 16. The curse involved the woman's relationship to her children. In sorrow you will bear them, and sorrow shall be your conception, and sorrow your, your sorrow will be multiplied. It's talking about her relationship with her children. In verse 16 also, the curse involved the woman's relationship to the husband. Your desire shall be to your husband, but he shall rule over thee. I'm not going to go into all the, what all that means. Um, in verse 17 through 19, because the man listened to the woman, and I'm not even going to go with a joke on this one. Just because the man listened to the woman, the man had to suffer the consequences of the curse as well. Not going to even go there. But notice, notice, if you notice that passage of Scripture, that in the man's curse, it was in his relationship to the ground. Man's part of the curse was in his relationship to the ground. You shall work, which they had to work before. Adam still had to work. But you shall work, but curse shall be the ground for your sake. And it shall bring up thorns and thistles, and, and in the sweat of your brow shall you bring the herb of the, herb of the field and all those kind of things. Everything rela relating to the man, the curse was re in relation to things. The ground, the plants, the crops, all of that. In every aspect for the woman, the, 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 the curse had to do with her relationship with people or with others. Every aspect of the curse when it came to the woman had to do with her relationship not to things but to others. You saw it with the, the uh, uh, there'll be enmity between the serpent and the woman. It also included her seed. Also included her children, her offspring. Shall have enmity between the enemy, the serpent, Satan. Will, and again, I'm not going to go into all the theological implications of all that. That's not what it is about. 
but had to do with her relationship with the serpent. And then turn around her relationship with her children. Then it turned around her relationship to her husband. And then it turned around the relationship of the husband to the wife that goes back and forth. But even in that, it still revolves around the wife. It still involves the wife. And it, it involves everything with her revolves around a relationship with other people. Here's my point. Mothers, you feel it more. You connect more. When babies have the boo-boo, they don't go to daddy usually. They go to mommy's. There's a connection that mothers have with their children. There's a connection with other people. There's a thing uh, that, that fathers and men will never understand. Obviously, it begins with the idea that it's the mother that carries the child for nine months. And so there's a connection there. The, the very life of the child in the womb of the mother is dependent upon the mother. Yes, men had their part. Little bitty tiny part. The very life of the child for the first nine months is totally dependent upon the mother. I remember when Christy was pregnant with Brianna, our first child, and um, uh, the and I won't go into all the details of this, but the doctors, there were some issues. And so the, the doctors put Christy on all kinds of medicine. I mean, just... She was taking medicine in the morning, at midday, at night. Uh, she, it was all kinds of medicine that was that uh, every way you could take it, some kind of medicine. She was taking it, and uh, and and the the point was is that there was a certain uh, a certain hormone that Christy wasn't um, wasn't producing, and the doctor explained it to us like this: there are basically three hormones in every human body. There's there's testosterone, which we all know. There's estrogen, which we all know. We all know that testosterone is the one that is, um, uh, is related to men. Uh, you ever seen the commercials about men with suffering from low testosterone? You don't hear that commercial about women because women don't, you know. They have it, but they have it at such low doses it doesn't make a difference. And so it's men that are, that are, that are, um, that are connected to testosterone. Um, I have a wife and three daughters. For the longest time, I had a wife, three daughters. My mother-in-law lived with us. We had two pets, and both of them were female. I was swimming in a sea of estrogen. Estrogen was all over the place. It oozed from the walls, and it dripped from the ceiling, and it was just, I, I, I couldn't get away from it. It was everywhere. Because estrogen deals with women, and so that's what estrogen is. But there's a third hormone that's in every human body, and it's called progesterone. I say that. Let me back up. It's not in every human body. It's only in one type of human body, and that's in the female progesterone and the purpose of progesterone the only women only have it the whole purpose of progesterone it is it is the hormone that females produce in order to keep the baby alive until the the baby can sustain its own self once the baby is developed enough that the baby can sustain its own self um the, you know then it starts to produce its own estrogen testosterone those kind of things but women have a hormone in them that is strictly for one purpose and one purpose only. That is to sustain, to sustain life within themselves. Therefore, there is a connection that women have to their children that a father will have because if for no other reason there was a point in time in the life of that child that was absolutely dependent upon the mother, not only for feeding but for life itself because if it was not for the progesterone that the woman was producing in her body, the baby would not live. I'm not talking about feeding. I'm not talking about eating for two. I'm not talking about that. I'm literally talking about inherent within the woman's body is something that is developed and God has created within you that the entire purpose of that hormone is to sustain life and no other reason. Mothers, you make the difference. None of us would be here without a mother. In fact, when Christy was, um, was struggling trying to, to, uh, with this hormonal thing and the progesterone, she wasn't producing any. That was the problem. And, uh, and, and I remember they had her on all this medicine, and the medicine was making her sick, and it was, it was crazy. And uh, I remember coming home one day from work, and Christy was sitting in the bathroom floor crying. Um, and, 
and I asked her, I said, what, 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 you okay, everything okay? Yeah, everything's fine. What's wrong, what's wrong? She had all the medicine. And she said, medicine's making me sick, and I can't do this anymore. Either God is going to take care of me and take care of my baby, or God won't. And she flushed every bit of the medicine down the toilet. And Brianna is now 23 years old. Because of the faith of the mother. Because you know what I did when she did that? I panicked. What? What are you, 24? Oh, she's what? 24. Don't tell her I said 23. She's not in here, is she? Oh, yes, she's right there. She's 24. It was the faith of the mother. Not just something inherent in her body, the progesterone, the hormone that men don't have. It was her faith that produced life. When Brianna was born, the doctor said, that's great and wonderful. That, I don't know how it happened. I can't explain it. Of course, we said we can, but that was, you know, another. And, but, but you're not going to have any more. You're not going to have any more. And then by the time we had Kennedy, we were wishing we had stopped, bef- you know. I'm, yeah. There was something, and I'm not here to praise my wife, although I could do that very easily, but there was something inside of that mother not just in her body in her heart in her soul in her mind in her spirit in her very very being in her very core there was something in the mother that the father didn't have that actually produced and sustained life you know what the scripture says about god almighty it says that in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth and then he created life and then in colossians it says that the all things, all things by Jesus, all things are held together. You know what that literally means? It means that life is sustained because of Jesus. You and I are alive today because of the grace of God and the love of Jesus Christ. And you want to find out what God is like? You start looking at a mother and you'll find out that there is a love in a mother that will not only love when nobody else will love, but has the ability to sustain life itself. That's a God thing inside of every mother moms you make the difference you have connections that us fathers will never have you feel like us father because because everything about the curse had to deal with relationship i, I am amazed that women can read people like men can't um i i i uh, I, I've been told, uh, I, Christy has come to me a few times. I have to, because she's the only, she's the mother I know best, right? And so uh, we'll be 28 years. It is 28 years, right, in July? I want to get that part right. Okay, good. We've been together 29, 28 years of marriage. It'll, it'll be in, in July. And, and uh, Christy can read people that, in ways that I can't. And has told me, you, you need to watch out for that person. Speaking of which, Richard, you and I need to have a conversation after church today. No, I'm playing. Um, She's like, there's something about them. Just a little left of center. She's been right every time. Women have the ability to read people. Mothers have the ability to read people that, that, that men can't. It's amazing. Um, it, it's, uh, it is scientific, but it's kind of magic at the same time. It's kind of weird how you do that. It's kind of freaky, to be honest with you. But it's because everything that, uh, it, with a mother, it involves relationship. Everything. So how, I want to bring this together to, uh, about the family, and I, w- I want to do this, and i got to think about this. Who do I want to use? Uh, Tina, last year I used you. Um, man, to do that again. Um, you know what? I want to use one of my favorite people. Miss Ann, would you come here, please? And would you bring your daughter and your son with you? Yes. See, I don't really care about them, but you're one of my favorite people. So they just got to come along for the ride, you know. Here's what I, I want you to stand right here, and I want you to face that way. 
and then I want and then I want you two to face her on either side. Just like that. Perfect. Now, you don't know this. I'm going to tell you. When I do this, usually I go off and preach for about 10 or 12 minutes and then come back. So you just hang loose, all right? So, okay, he's good. At the end of that, the scripture says that Adam called her Eve. Notice at the curse, the man's name did not change. His name stayed Adam. Her name changed, but there's a, there's, a, there's a thing about that. The word, the name Eve is an interesting word. It literally, in the original language, means life giver. That's what it means. And it's not just the idea of the life that comes from the womb of the mother. I'm not going to ask your age. How old are you, sir? 46. 46. See, my wife did teach me a few things. <laughs> 46 years old, and she still feeds life into you, doesn't she? The term life giver is not just about producing life. It's about in every time she talks to him and every time she talks to her, every time there's a conversation that mom is talking about how sweet you are and I'm bragging about my kids. Every time, I, I'm going to tell you, there's not a conversation. I thank God my mother's still alive. Every time I have a conversation with my, mother, with my mother, I feel just a little bit better. It's amazing. Not always the case with my dad, but with my mom. <laughs> I won't go into that. With my mom, every time I talk to my mom, I feel a little bit better. There's some little bragging she does or some way she tells me that she loves me, and it's something about I feel a little bit better. There is life that constantly comes from the mother to the children. It's a constant life-giving. Life, the life giver is a present participle. It's constantly going. And so she's constantly feeding life into her kids. And so they're facing her in order to get life. But then there's another thing about that. There's another thing about that that the scriptures see because this is where we got to understand spiritually. Because, mother, because everything revolves relationally around you, when it comes to the attack of the enemy, guess where he's going to attack when he wants to attack the family? He attacks the hub because it's all about her when it comes to relationship. The relationship for the man is to the ground. And so we can go on, and if, if wife and kids, move, we fight, we get jobs, we move on, we, we, we can move on. Everything about the mother is about relationship. So if he wants to destroy the family, guess where he's going to attack? He's going to attack mom. So as they turn to her and get life, then it's the job of the husband and the children that have been fed by the mother, the life giver, that they then in turn turn around okay, to protect the life. This is why the scripture says, honor your father and your mother. Do you know in the scripture, the scripture never says for a wife to love her husband, not once. Now, that doesn't mean wives, you can stop love. Cause see, don't have to command something that's already there. I don't have to look at you, Larry, and say, Larry, breathe. Okay, now breathe again. And okay, now breathe. I don't need to go around with you every three seconds telling you to breathe. It's natural. It's inherent within us. Wives are not told to love their husbands. Why? It's inherent because everything about them is relationship. Everything about them is love. Everything about them is connection. Everything about them is sustaining the life of the husband and the kids. And, and, and everything, in fact, do you notice, can I, if you go back to verse 20 and 21, the first thing that happened after the curse was pronounced upon man, man turned around and talked to the wife and said, you're Eve, you're the life giver. The first thing, he didn't go talking to God about why are you going to make me do all this work? Why the thorns and the thistles? He didn't blame the wife. He didn't complain about the wife. He didn't do anything. He said, I have been hit with a curse. Life is now going to be hard. It's going to be harder than I can take. There are going to be things that I can't handle. The thorns and the thistles and this pressure and all the things fighting the ground and fighting the world is going to be more than I can take. I need a life giver at home who is helping me and supporting 
hurting me. And so because of that, the scripture never says that the, the wife is to love the husband, but always the scripture tells the husband, love the wife, protect the wife, be with there, be there for her, give her strength, give her protection. Give, and so as the mom is giving life and the wife and the husband have gotten life from the kids and, and the, the husband and the children, excuse me, then it's our job in turn as we face them and get life, we then turn around and we protect her. We protect the mother. Listen, the problem in the world with the fatherless society that we're having is is leaving mothers unprotected. That is a failure in this nation. It is the job of the family to stand up and protect the mothers. We have to. They are the center of attack. They're the focal point of attack for the enemy. It's the job of the children and the husbands to protect the mother. Protect them. Because if the enemy wants to destroy the family from the inside out, and he'll start with mom. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. So you get this symbiotic type of relationship, Tyler. Where the mother is feeding the kids and feeding the husband and giving them life and helping them and giving them strength. It was when Adam, when he suffered the consequences of the curse, when he suffered the consequences of the curse, he looked to, he looked to his wife and said, I need to give you a different title. And giving her a different title, it gave her a different function. He called her Eve, which meant life giver. And that what he needed from her, listen, what he needed from her, when the, when the wife was behind him, 110 and 20%. In fact, I, I'm reminded of the old saying, you know, it says for every great man, there's a wife or a woman standing behind him usually shaking her head, wondering what in the world is he doing. But that's, you know. Mothers. I'm, I'm not trying to bash husbands. I'm not trying to, I'm not, I'm not trying, I'm not trying to bash children. I'm not, I, I, I'm trying to encourage you. Your wife, your mother's. They don't need the criticism. They're not perfect. Never be perfect. Not till they get to the other side. And most mothers understand they're not perfect. In fact, most mothers are too hard on themselves. Most mothers feel like, can, can just by, just, I, I'm not going to embarrass anyone. How many mothers here feel like you really just aren't enough? I don't know why I have my hand up. Um, most mothers already feel that. It's our job to protect them. It's our job to put them in that elevated place that they were meant to be. Mothers, you make the difference. You're special. And it's the job of the kid the job of the husband to protect her. A husband does not protect his wife because she is weak. A husband protects his wife because she is special. She matters. So everything for the mother is relational. Everything. Everything. And everything, the mother is the life giver. I make this joke, um, I, and I've done it for years with the kids, and they always roll their eyes at me when, uh, if I come home from work or whatever, and I'm sitting on, if I'm sitting in my recliner, you can hang it up. I'm not getting back up. Um, if I'm sitting in my recliner and one of the kids go to the ki kitchen or something, hey, would you get your dad a, something to drink or refill my tea? Oh, dad, I'm like, I gave you life. Fix my tea. called her Eve because she's the life giver, the mother. See, he called her Eve because she's the mother of all living. The word mother there is an interesting word in the original language. It means the bond, the glue that holds the family together is the mother. 
Because, mothers, because everything around you, is, everything with you is relational. Because you're the life giver. You're the, you set the tone. You're the melody for the song that the family sings. You're the melody. Because you give it beauty. Because you're the life giver. And, and because everything with you is relational. Then it's the job of the rest of the family to protect her. Are you with me? Every husband and child in here, will you say amen? It's our job to protect them. So I want to end with a challenge to mothers for my part. Then we've got something else I want to do. And, and Christy, whenever you're ready, come on. Mothers, I want you to listen to me. The term mother is linked to the idea of the word living in verse 20. Called her Eve because she's the mother of, of all the living. Mothers, you are the key to the life and the members of your family and the relationships in your family. Your input matters. Your attitude toward your children and their father has a significant impact on the dynamic of the family. Your words matter. What you say to the children and to their father matters more than you think. If you are always critical, always nagging, always disrespectful or dismissive of the children or your husband, because you're the life giver, if you act that way, you will drain life from them. You are the key to the life of those in your family. I challenge you to mind your words and how you interact with those in your family. You make the difference. 1 Peter chapter 3, in fact, talks about the wife winning the husband to the Lord by the life that she lives. That promise is not given in reverse. It does not say that the husband will win the wife by the life that he lives. That promise is only given to the wife. The wife can win the husband by the life that she lives. The lives and the living of the members of your family hang in the balance, and you are the one that tips the scales. Mothers, you matter. I haven't called my mother yet today. I will do that this afternoon. My mother is not perfect, but my mother was a godly, is a godly woman. She wasn't always, she wasn't always saved. But I thank God for the example of my mother. Mothers, you matter. My mom is quiet in public. She doesn't say a lot. She's kind of an introvert. In, in a lot of ways. But my mother made the difference at home. If your mother is alive today, take the time to give her honor. And if you have spent your adult life, because it's so easy to do to talk about our parents, right? If you've spent your adult life criticizing and, and, and not protecting your mother, if she knows it, would you be an adult and apologize? And if she doesn't, would you do that from this day forward? The mother is the focal point of the attack of the enemy because the mother is the one that relationships all revolve around. The mothers, you matter. And we want to take this day and honor you, but hopefully I, I pray that from this day forward, every husband and every child in this room will do their part to protect you because the enemy is going to come at you. If the enemy wants to destroy, if Satan wants to destroy the family, he'll attack the mother because you're the center of it all. I'm going to be preaching on this in two weeks. Um, I'm going to finish the series, The Wilderness, next week. Um, if you have been watching anything of our services you need to go back and, and there's going to be eight sermons in this series, The Wilderness. It's uh, not because I preached it, because it's the Word of God. It's a phenomenal series. You need to go back. Some people need to hear that the sermon on the Taskmaster. Um, probably need to listen to it twice. Um, go back and listen. But I'm going to finish The Wilderness next week. In two weeks, I'm going to preach on the blessing. I'm going to be preaching from Psalm 133, and I can't wait to get to it. 
But we're going to start doing something a little different at the end of services. We're going to do this today. In fact, I've, I've written this out. Christy, you can come on. It's right here. We're going to end Mother's Day with a blessing on mothers. And as the, the wife uh, of the, the pastor's wife and kind of the first lady of the church, that's the term now, right? They use first lady. Whatever. Um, as the first lady of the church, I've asked her to read this, this blessing over you. So mothers, this is for you. We have a Mother's Day blessing. Yes, mothers, would you stand? Mothers, I'll get you ready. Would you stand? You've got it in your arms. Well, you're fine. Okay. Well, Hey, I had the neatest thing happen last week. I went over and talked to little Lily, and she came to me. It was, oh, it was so adorable. Not because it was me, because it was her. It was so awesome. And I keep telling my wife, see, kids do like me. I'm not scared of them. Uh, they don't know me. You're right. You're right. Mothers, this is, this is for you, Christy. Go ahead.
Are you glad for your mom? I was talking to Bethany the other day, and I'm glad Matt's still in here. Bethany, uh, this pertains. For those of you who don't know, I am married to their second daughter. So they, the pastor and first lady are my in-laws. And Bethany brought up, you know, when we met, Bethany was younger, and I was not. And I'll just, let's just say, if we got married when we met, I'd go to jail. And Bethany goes, how would you feel if your sister came up to you at 17 and her boyfriend wanted to get married? And I said, now I see why your parents hated me when we first met. But I'm just so thankful for a mother-in-law who now I think I'm her favorite. Mom, so thankful for my actual mom. I think two of these gray hairs are because of Taylor, the rest of mine are for me. I've put this woman through some crazy stuff. That's true. She used to be six foot two, but all the stress made her shrink. I get my good looks from her. I don't know who I got my brains from, because I don't think I have any. But I am so thankful for my mom. And like Pastor said, the enemy will attack the wife, the mom. She actually told me the other day, she says, when I was in high school, and the, if, she, if something ever got to me, she would get sick. She would get attacked through sickness. She's carried a lot of stuff. And I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for my mom. Like Pastor says, if you have a mom, you need to call her. You need to honor her. It's interesting. Thank you. It's interesting. Ephesians 5. We always want to talk about how the woman, how the wife, should submit to the husband. But it's interesting. The rest of Ephesians 5 talks about the husband, how you should lead, how you should love. Men, if your wife is not a Proverbs 31 woman, maybe you're not an Ephesians 5 man. If your wife's not godly, maybe she learned it from you. But with that being said, remember our announcements this coming Saturday, May 15th. We will be at the Pine Level Dollar General Saturday, May 15th from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Meet us there. We will bring a tent. We'll probably have waters and cars to hand out, a little bit of everything. We just want to reach the community, let them know that we're here, let them know that we're praying for them. We pray for people in the parking lot. We hand them cards, invite them to the church. We hand out candy, we hand out water, we just hand out a little bit of everything just to let them know that we love them. And if they don't have a home church, to come here. But if they do, stay faithful there. And then two weeks from today, May 23rd, is graduation Sunday. We are going to honor our graduates. Whether that's kindergarten graduation, high school graduate, college graduate, we want to honor them. So if you have a graduate in your family, bring them. We want to honor them. And uh, whatever walk of life they're in, wherever they're going, we want to honor them. That is it. It is not too late to sign up for youth camp. Youth camp is June 7th to the 25th. It's the whole month of June. It's from ages 7 to 18. If you'd like to sign up, please come see one of us. Uh, we can get you. It's not too late to sign up. We will do that. And we are also in the process of fundraising money so that you, the parents, don't have to pay as much, if at all. That's the goal. But we need to sit down and crunch the numbers. That's the goal. That parents won't have to hopefully pay anything whatsoever because we want our youth and our children to be able to go to youth camp, have fun, meet friends, and carry those friendships on for the rest of their life. Amen? I think that's it. Have a fantastic day. Wednesday, 6 p.m. starts prayer. 6.30 is Bible study. Hope to see you then. Have a fantastic week, everyone.